morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jim Scarlata from New York State DOT. I'm with the Structures Design Bureau, the Assistant Director. I'm going to talk to you today about joint elimination, uh, link slabs, and some other things that we're doing with UHPC. So I'll get started. So we're going to cover why eliminate joints. It should be pretty obvious at this point. Um, our current practices in New York State. Um, then we'll focus on UHPC link slabs. What are they? Why, why would you want to use them? And then how do they work? Um, and then we'll also look into what, what, makes a good, what makes a bridge a good candidate for using UHPC link slabs to eliminate the joints. Then we'll quickly go over some other preservation strategies that we're doing with UHPC. And then uh, at the end, we'll have a little bit of time for questions and answers, hopefully. So just a reminder, I'm sure everyone knows this, but why do you want to eliminate bridge joints? One, they require free, frequent maintenance. Um, they can be hazardous to the traveling public, you know, especially here in the Northeast with the snow plows tearing up the joints and uh, scattering debris all over the roadway. It can be a, a huge hazard. Then also just the... Uh, User comfort, you know, driving over the bridges with joints is, you know, you hear the, the thump and the little bit of vibration, and it's just really nice when you have a nice smooth surface. So the prone to leakage, they expose the underlying components to deterioration. You kind of get the, what I like to call trickle-down deterioration, where it comes to the girder ends, uh, bearings, and, and substructures, and pretty much any, any component that's located underneath that joint will um, get deteriorated and... Uh, can severely reduce the service life of a bridge. So some joint elimination methods that we use. So the first one here on the top part of the screen where we come in and, and splice the girders to eliminate the joint at a pier. Um, so this method has been around for a while. Um, it does require some design. You're adding continuity. So you, you, um, you may have to do some top flange strengthening for tension that the girder wasn't originally designed for. You may have to um, maybe add some diaphragms for the bottom flange to address the, the compression that you're adding and um, any buckling. Um, some of the issues with this method is this, you know, these bridges aren't fabricated or to be spliced. You know, things don't perfectly line up and things shift over time. So that, that can be a, a major problem when you go to do this sort of uh, technique. Um, next method here, shown in the bottom, we encase everything in a concrete diaphragm. So that eliminates the issues with uh, misalignment of girders, so that's good. But you also, you're adding continuity, so you have those, that drawback there. Uh, another method that we use is we convert um, a conventional abutment to integral abutment. Uh, this is, uh, you know, great technique. Integral abutments, you know, are great. We big fan of those. But... Um, the issue with this is it's really limited to shorter spans. Our, our rule is about 50 feet. So once you go over 50 feet, the thermal movements become such that you're introducing a lot of stresses into your abutments that they weren't designed for um, and the foundations. So it's kind of limited use for that. And then the last one is um, kind of our, our go-to, UHPC link slabs. And um, I'll discuss those further in a little bit here. So just a, a quick kind of back to basics. So this is without continuity on the left. Um, you can see that the, um, you have positive bending moments shown here in red. Then you have your shear in blue. Now when you jump over to the right here and you add continuity, you reduce some of the positive moments, but the trade-off is you're adding this negative moment. So now you're going to have to check to see if your existing beams can take that and potentially strengthen them for that. And then another aspect, if you look at the shear, so your live load reactions, because of the um, added continuity, will go up by 25%. So if your pier is kind of borderline passing your design, you may have some strengthening there, and you also have to look at the foundation for that increase in load. So it can add a substantial amount of work, so we try to avoid the continuity when we can. So, you know, like I mentioned, we, we think link slabs are, are the best way to eliminate joints. It's economical. We reduce that design time that comes along with adding the continuity. The amount of work, the structural removal is much um, less. It's very confined to just around the pier. You don't have to strengthen your top flange, say, 
you know, out into the spans. Um, also, we avoid those uh, higher, higher beam reactions. And the link slabs, as far as we can tell, offer um, a long and maintenance-free service life. And they're also really versatile. Um, you can use them um, on many different uh, superstructure types, steel beams, concrete beams, uh, trusses, uh, just to name a few that we've done. Um, it also accommodates uh, vast types of geometry, you know, long spans, short spans, uh, higher skews, uh, splayed girders, curved girders. Um, it all works well with, with those type of structures. All right, now I'll get into a uh, little more into the UHPC link slabs. So what is a link slab? So we have a, a three-span bridge here simply supported, and essentially what you go in, you do, you remove the, the joints at your piers and essentially extend the deck where the joint was. Uh, a few construction photos of what that looks like. So the first step, you're going to do um, maybe a one inch deep saw cut about two feet away from the joint, and then you'll demo out the rest of the joint with chip hammers, clean everything up, that's what it looks like there. You're going to want to retain your longitudinal reinforcement that you're going to use that to, as your anchor, to anchor in the link slab to the slab, to your deck. Next photo there shows the guys, uh, they're forming up, they're reconstructing the, the bottom portion of the deck, and then they're going to leave a recess on top, and that's where the UHPC is going to go. And then the last photo, you can see they're filling that recess with, with the UHPC and installing the, the top forms. So the number one reason we use link slabs, like I mentioned, joint elimination for the reason you see there, the, the trickle-down deterioration. Um, now, once we started using link slabs, this was back in 2013, we constructed our first UHPC link slab. We did it for joint elimination, but over the years, we found some other uh, uses for them. One of those being accelerated construction. Um, we find it, you know, in situations with, with shorter spans, it's much simpler and faster just to use you know, individual simple spans so you don't have to do multiple cranes and splicing in the air and everything. You just pick it and set it, and then you can put a link slab in um, at the discontinuity and have a, in a very durable structure. It's also really good for prefabricated beam, beam units. Uh, you can, you know, those are the, with a couple beams with a deck already on it, you pick those up, place them. You can pour UHPC to connect those units and then do the link slab as well at your piers. Also a complex framing geometry. Um, in situations where your bridge width is changing, you know, if you're trying to use continuous girders, keeping those lines continuous over the supports can be difficult. Um, you end up splaying them and, and, you know, having odd spacing and it's, you know, very hard to fabricate the type of geometry um, you can avoid all that with simple spans and just placing straight girders along cords and that sort of thing. Also address continuous span uplift, situations where you may not be able to place your piers in ideal locations and you have a very short end span. If you made that continuous, you may need counterweights and, and tie downs or whatnot to pre prevent, you know, mitigate the uplift. Um, but if you just go with a simple span and link slab, you don't have to worry about any of that. Also, with uh, continuous spans, we always see some cracking right over the pier. Usually it's one kind of larger crack in the middle and a couple feet away on either side is some smaller cracks, so we can avoid that with link slabs. Um, also, from the seismic standpoint, we can re reduce the seismic vulnerability. Um, when you have you know, a bunch of you know, individual spans you know, acting independently during a seismic event, um, you know, they're moving in all different directions. It's very hard to predict the actual forces and them banging into each other and, and everything that happens. So once we connect everything together, we slow things down a lot. Um, it's much more controlled response, much more predictable from the analysis standpoint. And then you can also use the bearings, um, the stiffness of bearings, to get a more uniform distribution of your forces to all your substructures. So we, we found some benefits there as well. All right, so now I'll get into kind of the mechanics of a link slab, how, the, how this works. So before the link slab goes in, um, 
you'll have this, you know, your two lines of bearings at a pier with the joint above. So when the spans are loaded, you're going to rotate at the bearing, and this is going to result in a little bit of uh, translation at the top. So every time the truck loads the span, the joint opens up a tiny bit, and then the truck comes off, it closes back up. Now, when, what happens when you install a link slab up top is you're forcing the rotation now to occur up in the slab. So, as you might expect, once you're rotating up top, now your translation occurs down at the bearing level. Um, now, when you're looking just at the link slab itself for the design of it, this is basically what you want to do. You apply two moments and get a uniform bending force in the link slab, and those moments come from the girder rotation. Um, and to achieve a uniform bending moment, you're going to want to have that link slab debonded so it's, it's free to bend. So you get a uniform moment, you're not concentrating any stresses in one area. But now if you take kind of a, a step back and look at what's happening to your entire structure from a global standpoint, there's where you want to consider the link slab to act as a hinge. Um, if you compare the stiffness of the link slab to the rest of the superstructure, it's pretty much negligible. So it acts as a hinge. So it's kind of a key distinction. And you know, with a hinge, you're no longer taking movements at that location where you've installed a link slab. So that's where things get a little tricky. You have to look at your bearing arrangement. Typically, you have to change out that, your bearings to, for, to a new arrangement. You have to look at um, you know, seat lengths. And then also, typically, you want to take all the movement off of the bridge and um, use you know, a moving approach slab and put the joint after the approach slab so that you, you know, protect the bridge. So we use two types of link slabs in New York State. Uh, first showing here is the conventional. So this was developed in like the late 1980s. Um, didn't really see much use until the early 2000s. And uh, essentially what goes on here is um, the deck would be removed. And in this blue area is the bonded zone. And all the shear studs are going to be removed in this area. And they're going to put a bond breaker in the top flange so that that can bend as the girder rotates. And then we have the anchor zones on the end where we take any forces that are generated within the link slab, anchor those back into the slab, and then ultimately down into the girder's top flange. Um, these can be somewhat lengthy. Typically, it's about 10% of your span. So if we're looking at, you know, if these were 100-foot spans on each side, this, this total removal area in link slab would be about 20 feet long. Um, so comparing that with UHPC, as you can see, significantly shorter, and the reason for that is we're taking advantage of UHPC's advanced material properties. So we can use much shorter length um, and also a much thinner slab, which is going to attract less moment. And um, yeah, we got the impermeability of the UHPC and the very high strain capability. Um, it really works well um, for a link slab. So the benefits. Um, only require reconstruction of the deck end, so your work area is very limited, and um, this allows you, in your, if you're in urban areas with high traffic volumes, you can do most of your work at night and plate over it during the day. Um, and it also reduces the duration compared to the conventional link slab. And, um, you know, they're highly durable, inherently ductile due to UHPC's material properties. And there's a cool photo there in the bottom left showing uh, really the flexibility of this material that's just uh, plain UHPC, no steel reinforcement, just the fibers. Um, you can really bend it without it cracking. So some scoping considerations, what you know, makes a good candidate, um, what to look for. So you want to do this on a deck that's in you know, fair condition at least. You wouldn't want to go through all this trouble to just come back and have to tear up the deck you know, 10 years or so later. So you see a photo there of a good example. Um, you know, we have some deterioration right around the deck end, but that's going to be removed anyway to install a link slab. And the rest of the deck is in really good shape, just a little uh, polishing in the wheel paths. We can diamond grind that, and uh, we'll have a good, good looking deck surface. Uh, we also use it for precast deck replacements. We, requ we require uh, precast panels to be connected with UHPC. Um, between the panels and then also for the haunch connection. So we are, we've already got UHPC on site 
and uh, they can pour the haunches and joints and link slab all at the same time. Um, having a no skew or a slight skew will just make your life easier. I'll talk about what skew a little bit in the next slide. Um, it's always nice to have a weekend closure too, so you can uh, you can do your re deck end reconstruction, changing bearings, all your other work. You can do that in stages or at night with road plates. And then uh, if you can get one weekend, then you can come in, pour your UHPC in one shot. It will be cured and ready to go by uh, Monday morning. Another thing to look for is when if you have uh, if you're looking to replace bearings anyway, if they're deteriorated or unstable, steel rocker bearings shown there, you're most likely going to have to replace those if you're installing a link slab because you're changing thermal movements around. So you can kind of kill two birds with one stone. Now some of the obstacles, um, I mentioned it's ideal to have no skew or low skew. You can do it on high skew, it just makes your life difficult. Um, you know, Trying to get the bearings to fit, you may have to, you know, clip off your masonry plate, um, you know, have your anchor bolts pretty close to the edges, that sort of thing. Uh, it also affects, it complicates the horizontal load distribution, um, which typically changes when you install link slabs because you're changing your points of fixity. Um, so it's, there's a lot to that, no, not much time here to get into it, but just mentioning that. Um, if you have, uh, railing mounted on the top flange. Uh, this isn't very common, but we have some bridges like this where the, the fascia girder is taller and the railing's mounted up here. This would be very difficult to do a link slab. Um, with link slabs, you really want to keep, you want to avoid any large steps or elevation changes because you want that to flex and you don't want any stress risers. So you really couldn't step the link slab up here and then how to seal it with this curb detail would be very difficult. So. We try to avoid those type of situations. Um, post tension deck, showing a, a photo of that here. You just you have the anchorage that's just typically in the interferes with where the link slab would go. So that's usually a no go. And then also pin and hangers. We we try to avoid those. I'll explain that here. So um, there's what I would say a theorized uh, increase in tension in the pin and hanger. Um, so what happens is before the link slab would go in, you have your cantilevered span on the left here, suspended on the right. You're rotating about that blue dot, uh, the upper pin, and um, so that's how you're taking your girder rotation and movements. But when you install a link slab, you're now going to force the rotation up into the slab. So now your your kind of your lever arm is longer, and you're rotating along a larger radius arc. You can kind of see that there. So that's going to want to, um, you know, kind of leverage and, and extend your your pin and hanger, and that's going to add tension to a system that's that's already a little sketchy. So do not recommend doing that. Um, so what we we would typically do is a sling retrofit, kind of a catch system. Um, you know, this is great; it removes the the vulnerability, but you still have a joint, so you have to deal with the maintenance of that deterioration. So, one way to mitigate all that is um, a detail that we got from our neighbors in Massachusetts. We call it a shiplap detail. You're basically you're going in, removing the pin and hanger, cutting the ends of the girder off, um, splicing in some dapped girder ends, and creating kind of a bridge seat there. And this would work well with a link slab. Um, something we haven't done yet, but we're considering it on a current project. So now, um, some other preservation strategies that we're doing with UHPC. Uh, we're using it for overlays on adjacent box beams. A uh, common issue that we have is longitudinal cracking due to differential deflection of the box beams. Um, the shear keys, after some time, will fail and give us the what some call the, the piano key effect, where one beam's def deflecting further um, than the adjacent one, maybe in the wheel path, and you get longitudinal cracking that reflects up through your deck. I'll see a photo of that there, nice longitudinal crack. Um, on this structure, we went underneath, and you can see we've got some leakage going on, but we don't have um, major deterioration yet, so we, the idea is we can go in, put the UHPC link slab, stop that differential deflection, 
and seal up the top surface and prevent any further deterioration. Uh, a couple photos of that here. So this is uh, kind of in the middle of the UHPC length, UHPC uh, overlay pour. See, we got the hydro demoed surface, and what's great about the hydro demo is um, any deteriorated areas will be removed. You can see we've got some kind of deep valley here with some ex uh, reinforcement exposed, so all that bad concrete came out, and the overlay will fill that back in. There's just a quick photo of what the final product looked like. Um, we did this in 2019, and um, the last inspection report in um, April of this year, we still don't have any longitudinal cracks showing up, so um, so far so good, and uh, we're hopeful that, that we've solved that problem on this, on this bridge. Another thing we've used it for is for beam end repair. So a few shots here of what we typically do, the bolting on plates and angles to address the deterioration from you know, the joint above. And in extreme cases, we're welding in a T-section, which, you know, Pretty expensive, involves jacking the superstructure, fitting up the steel, uh, welding it, inspecting it, testing. So the beam end repair, you can avoid all that. Um, it's a pretty simple process here. So you start out on the left, clean up all your steel, and then you're in the middle there shooting on steer, shear studs uh, to any of the remaining steel that's in, still intact. Um, our rule of thumb is a quarter inch or more We'll weld a shear stud on there. So during the design, you kind of just determine how many studs you need, and then you give them flexibility in a field to basically place those studs where they, where you have the sufficient material thickness. And then the last step, you form it up and encase it and pour UHPC, create a UHPC uh, panel, more or less, that's attached to the girder. And the way this works is pretty simple. You're just creating an, an alternate load path around a deterioration. Um, so we've done one pilot project with this. Let's show uh, a few photos and details of that. See our shear studs and um, UHPC there on the on the left, and the photo on the right shows. Um, so this was a really good candidate for the beam end repair due to the complex geometry. We had uh, 60 degree skew, so we had some bent connection plates and just a really tight area there that would have been very difficult to do the conventional repairs. We've got a few construction photos. You can see the girder ends cleaned up, the shear studs on. Then on the right, they've got the forms in place. Here's our UHPC mixing operation using a horizontal shaft mixer in front of a, a skid steer and um, filling three gallon buckets. And then they had a, a very advanced UHPC delivery system, uh, a rope, a pulley, and a bucket, and a, a guy up in a man lift that dumps it in the top of the form. And uh, there's the nearly completed product. We've got the form stripped. Now we just need to come back and, and paint the girder ends. One last thing that we uh, were using UHPC in the realm of preservation is for UHPC joint headers. Um, we've done a fair number of these, and they're just, they really hold up well to, we've done them in areas in New York City with high, high truck traffic, um, also in areas with, with heavy snowfall, lots of snow plow blades, and um, they've really held up well. And one little added benefit is that in, in situations where you need to, you can actually overhang your deck end um, with the UHPC. Or typical headers, it's typically uh, a bad idea to do that, so. With that, that concludes my presentation. Um, thank you for your time and attention, and welcome any questions. Oh yeah, there, there's, there's certainly other materials that, the question was if there's other materials that can be used in, um, in lieu of UHPC. Um, yeah, there's definitely other materials. Um, there's some uh, EEC, I know some people have, uh, or ECC engineers, cementitious um, materials. 
or composites. Um, some other states have tried those and they seem to work. Um, we're looking at using HCSC. It's a hybrid synthetic um, concrete. I forget the acronym, but it's um, polymer concrete that's reinforced with fibers. Um, so there are, there are other materials, but it, it's, it's hard to beat UHPC in terms of its durability, its strain capability, the way that it remains impervious, um, even when you do bend it and flex it and it does crack, you get a lot of very, very fine micro cracks that are impervious, where other materials you may not get that performance. So. Yeah, it's something we're, we're looking at other materials, but at the moment we've only used UHPC. When you were de when you were detailing the uh, beamen repair, were you using uh, New York State forces for that? The beamen? No, that that was a contractor contractor job. Um, it's something we've kicked around the idea of using uh, our own forces. It's it is a you know. It looks like a simple operation, but you, you have to have uh, someone there that knows what they're doing in terms of mixing the UHPC and testing it and getting the slump right and everything else that goes into it. But um, I know, um, I think Michigan has done lots of UHPC with their own maintenance forces using their own non-proprietary mix, so it's definitely doable. With this UHPC, Mix formula. Have you been using any steel fibers or any any fibers for that matter in this mix, or oh. only the UHPC and the rebar? No, the UHPC has the fibers. It, that's uh, part of the definition of UHPC. It's always going to have the fibers, and um, we add some reinforcement as well, mainly for to anchor into the deck. Yeah, hi, I'm Ahmed Khan from DOT, uh, JDOT. Uh, question for the Lynx Labs. Uh, if a bridge is in service for like, let's say, 55 plus years, and uh, it's still in fair condition, um, let's say a deck is still fair, would you still go for a Lynx Lab at that point, or? Oh yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So the age doesn't matter in this case, right? No, it's yeah. just really the condition. Um, yeah, we've done, yeah, we've probably done bridges that are even older than that. And um, yeah, I mean, once you seal that thing up and uh, put a roof over it, um, you know, you cut down on the maintenance and you'll really, really extend the, the life of the structure. So yeah, that, that really doesn't come into play. It's just assess the condition. And typically, you're, all your deterioration is localized right around the joints. So you, you may, you know, just address that and then uh, get the joint out of there and you're good to go.